We are pleased to welcome onto the 966 American journalist, author, media executive, and Pulitzer Prize winner, Karen Elliott House. Karen has served as publisher at the Wall Street Journal, former senior vice president of Dow Jones. She's currently a senior fellow at the Belfer Center for International Affairs at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and on the board of the Rand Corporation. She was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for her coverage of the Middle East while a reporter with the Wall Street Journal. In addition to writing a series of articles on Saudi Arabia for the journal in 2007, Karen is author of the book On Saudi Arabia, Its People, Past, Religion, Fault Lines, and Future. Recently, she has written several opinion and commentary pieces for the Wall Street Journal on Saudi Arabia and the U.S.-Saudi relationship. And her most recent work is an in-depth paper on Saudi national priorities for the Belfer Center entitled Saudi First, Kingdom Pursues Independent Path. Karen, thank you so much for joining us on the 966. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, echoing Lucian's introduction. It's actually a great disservice to your depth of experience on Saudi Arabia to just be constrained to one episode. Um, so we'll we'll do our best. I want to I want to make a point on because Lucian last note was he he mentioned the Belfer Center papers you've written, mm -hmm. and I think they're a tremendous resource and and and, and folks should find them because it, interestingly enough. Uh, your first in this series, Uneasy Lies the Head That Wears a Crown, came out April 2016, which was the month that Vision 2030 was launched. Mm -hmm. um, then June 27, Saudi Arabia tra tra transition from de defense to offense. And then uh, in 2019, Profile of Prince, uh, which is an examination of Mohammed bin Salman. These are really, I think it's safe to say no other U.S.-based scholar uh, has such an extensive record of engagement in Saudi Arabia. And uh, so uh, thank you for joining us. And we don't want to spend too much time on it, but let's 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 sort of start at the first key takeaway of your last paper, your most recent paper, Saudi First. And that first key takeaway is Vision 2023 has transformed the kingdom since it launched in 2016. Can can let's just push play and and we'd be interested to know your to have your take on this well it has come it has transformed the kingdom totally culturally not yet economically but as someone who started going there in 1978 um and then and didn't wear an abaya because you could walk around as the crown prince says uh you know it was a normal country not like america but I went around in a skirt that came to my knees and a long sleeve blouse. And then came the the religiosity period after the fall of the Shah in Iran. And I donned my black abaya like everyone else. I didn't cover my head unless ordered to by the religious police or a judge, both of which happened to me. Um, but from all of that, from women being not seen and not heard um they have they are now seen heard working driving um being completely productive uh critical employees uh of the state they are i believe the people who will change the economy over time and that's actually one of the things uh it's actually comes out of your 2019 piece profile of prince one of the one of the uh, sections was amid sweeping social change, women are the winners. Mm -hmm. uh, can you expand on that? Because, uh, and, and as you say, you, you, you just suggested they'll be the drivers of change. Yeah. Well, he, uh, he says, um, I, uh, something to the effect of, I, I support Saudi Arabia and half of Saudi Arabia is women. So I support women. I mean, he views them as, full citizens in the enterprise of transforming the country and its economy. And so, you know, under him, um, they have been able to, uh, as time has gone by from the, these six years of, that he's been in charge, you know, you see more and more women uh, without black abayas. I mean, abayas are now a fashion statement, not a religious, uh, yes. you know, um, wrapping. Um, so you see women in beautiful, uh, stylish, 
pastel colors, you know, which would have landed you in um, the religious police headquarters um, 10 years ago. Um, but it's not just that they, that they can dress the way they want to. They are now allowed to travel, to exit the country without their husband or any other male approval. And in the past, if a woman tried to exit the country, the the uh, passport control people notified the man, uh, even if he had already approved, he got notified uh, because they didn't want a single woman to escape her her husband or father's um, total control. Um, so it's a, it's the liberation. And then obviously, as uh, a woman told me uh, in 2018, when women began to drive, being able to drive is not just about driving a car. It's about freedom of choice. And uh, the interesting thing to me um, in Saudi Arabia is that women did not, unlike I'm old enough to have been part of the cutting edge of women, you know, entering the workforce in the U.S. big time in the uh, 70s. There was no Gloria Steinem and there was no bra burning in uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, women just simply, uh, once the, the prince offered the opportunity, stepped up and, uh, and took them because they were actually prepared educationally um, in the years when the kingdom was so consumed with religiosity, men studied Islam in, uh, they were forced to study it in uh, elementary school and high school and after school, and many of them studied it in universities, so they had no useful skill. Um, and they went to work for the government, uh, lifetime employment with a degree in Islamic studies, which qualified you for nothing unless you were going to go on and become a true Islamic scholar. So women were had to study something. They weren't allowed to, you know, become Islamic uh, scholars because they were women. So they had skills. Um, and when given the opportunity, they were able to take the jobs and run with them. And every man you talk to in the kingdom these days, whether government or business, says they would rather hire women because not only are they better educated, they're much more motivated. We have, we've discussed on this show, the very marked diplomatic difference in Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman since January, 2021, which is that Olulu declaration and essentially a sort of a, a, a changing time where diplomacy was seemed to be one way before that and considerably different after that. This paper that you that you've done you've written Saudi First is based on on four trips to Saudi Arabia in October 2019, October 2021, March 2022, and March 2023. So you're very current, and it it it, it is entitled Saudi First for a reason. And if I can, I'll, 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 I'll we'll take a quote from it because there's there, by the way there's there's I, I can't recommend this paper uh, enough. I mean it's so much uh, good commentary and analysis in it. Um, but the quote, what you say, you know, uh, on this, the author's latest visit to Saudi Arabia, so it was sort of March 2023, mm -hmm. and meetings with most senior leadership is that the crown prince doesn't much care what American naysayers think. He is laser focused on one thing, building an economically powerful nation that he believes in a few decades could catapult into the top 10 economies in the world. So can you elaborate on the Saudi first title? Uh Saudi first, uh, I believe, in the kingdom means focusing on what's in Saudi Arabia's interest, not the U.S. interest, not anyone else's interest. So after decades of Saudi Arabia largely seeking to accommodate um, American presidents, I mean, there were lots of tensions before um, before Joe Biden called them a pariah, but um they were they saw themselves as uh, trusting largely the U.S. to protect them and needing the U.S. to protect them. 
since Obama's presidency, followed by Trump and now especially Joe Biden, they simply don't believe the U.S. has their best interest at heart. And they don't believe that the Americans will be there to protect them if if they need it. So it is the reason I believe that they have reached out and tried to improve their relationship with Iran, why they have definitely um, reached out to China. I mean, China is their biggest uh, market for their oil sales, but it's not just that. They see China as uh, as a useful um, shield uh, and partner. It's not as useful, obviously, as they wish because the Chinese sell arms to the Iranians. And when the Saudis complain about it, the Chinese just say, we'll sell you anything you want. <laughs> well, of course, they don't want more more uh, weaponry necessarily all over the Middle East. They would like peace because for, for Prince Mohammed, he is almost certainly going to be king when his very elderly father dies. And he's 37 now. He can rule for another half century. So unlike all previous Saudi rulers, he can't just kick the can down the road and, you know, not really care whether what he says and does produces any results because he's going to be there (laughs) to be held accountable when the results come or don't come. And the main result he's going to get measured on is the economic uh, transformation um there's lots of time to do it because oil is definitely going to continue to be used by the world far beyond the date the greens wish it would end um but he's got to take the steps that truly create a sustainable economy without oil revenue i mean if you look at um <laughs> You, you all, the um, Saudi U.S. Uh, report that you put out daily today, it talks about the um, Saudi the IMF reducing Saudi uh, economic growth projections for 2023 to 1.9%. That's versus 8.7% last year. And the reason they cite for that is the Saudis have cut oil production to try to prop up the price. So it, oil prices have a huge impact on their economic growth still. And that's one of the things he's trying to transit from. So again, Saudi first is him looking after reforming the economy and protecting the trillions of dollars they're spending on that from being blown up by Iran or any other potential enemy. I mean, it's a nightmarish job. I I don't envy him the, I don't know how he sleeps at night, actually, if you think about living in such a nasty neighborhood and investing, it's, you know, like somebody in a bad uh, neighborhood <clears throat> in America building a $50 million, uh, $50 billion house and, you know, knowing that somebody could torch it one night, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, thing to put your mind around. He doesn't <laughs> seem to, it doesn't seem to bother him, but it would me. I'm sure it weighs on his mind. And by the way, I, I, you know, to, you talk about the urgency that the crown prince feels and many in Saudi Arabia. I think the profile of a prince was a very interesting uh, paper on trying to under, understanding sort of the the what went into making Mohammed bin Salman, and you know why he is sort of on a mission in a hurry. Uh, it's an interesting read. Um, I also think it's fascinating as you mentioned that because one one of the curious things to us, I think, watching Saudi Arabia and looking at it every day, sort of on a granular granular level, is uh, the diplomacy is Saudi first, but it's also very regionally uh, attuned. Recognizing what you just talked about is basically we we need to pull the whole region along because uh, instability of surrounding us 
uh, threatens us. And I think it's interesting in their foreign aid now, you know, whereas before it was uh, sort of, you know, open handed largesse and, you know, here, give it to, mm-hmm. you know, a, a figure or whomever now is now tied increasingly to real serious economic reform uh, because they they want to see these neighboring countries um, not, you know, just collapse into instability. I think that's probably a reason why they, you know, they have brought Syria back into the Arab League. But speaking of, of you know, Saudi first, really interesting and very sort of bald comment that you make in, in, in the paper is, is very simple. It says disputes are not new. What is new is the way are, they are being handled. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as I said earlier, uh, there have been tensions in the U.S.-Saudi relationship since the beginning. I mean, when Franklin Roosevelt went there and met with uh, Ibn Saud, Ibn Saud's big message to him was, don't give the Jews Palestine. Um Roosevelt came home and died, and his his vice president became president and supported uh, the Jewish state in Palestine. That was obviously a source of tension in the uh, U.S.-Saudi relationship. Um, the clear high point of the relationship was when the U.S. sent 500,000 troops to Saudi Arabia in 1990 to protect its oil from Saddam Hussein, who had already invaded Kuwait and uh, had ambitions to uh, invade Saudi Arabia. Um, but it, 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 the, w- the, these tensions were always kind of quietly handled. Um, a letter from King Abdullah to George W. Bush saying you shouldn't have invaded Iraq, you know, you're going to hurt our country, but not, you know, uh, big headlines and ministers uh, condemning the U.S. Are the American president condemning Saudi Arabia for not supporting the invasion of Iraq? It was all much quieter. And now uh, Biden has taken it, the decibel level to a vast uh, uh, high uh, with all of the talk about pariah. And of course, He then wound up having to, if you will, eat his own words and go humbly there seeking more oil to help the Democrats during the 2022 election. And the crown prince just said no. Um, What does Riyadh want with the relationship? If, as you say, they they have serious doubts about uh, America's willingness to come to to Saudi Arabia's aid in time of crisis. And you pointed out, you referenced Obama, and I think you're talking about the 2012 Syrian chemical weapons use. And then of course, in 2019, when the Iranians hit some key uh, energy processing facilities. Uh, What do the Saudis want now? I mean, what they want is, uh, is a real security relationship with the United States. They just don't think they can get it. But as you know, um, there are all of these conversations uh, said to be going on again between Biden and his uh, national security advisor and his secretary of state and the Saudis and Israelis about um, Israeli Saudi um, diplomatic relations. All of the um, relations between Israel and an Arab country have basically been bought by America. Um, When the Egyptian-Israeli peace was done, we paid Egypt, and we then also gave uh, money to Israel, and the same when the Jordanians signed a peace. So what the Saudis are basically saying, they don't really want our money. What they're saying is, we need you to sign a real security commitment to Saudi Arabia. We need to be a real security partner like NATO, something that you can count on. And we need... um, certainty of arms shipments because the Congress changes from year to year and, you know, one Congress is what sells them something and the other one withholds it. 
Um, and they are just saying we can't run a um, because they're trying to make their own military much more useful. The, mili the Saudi military has traditionally been just an employment service. You know, people have a job in the military. They're not really expected to have to do anything. Uh, that's a bit harsh on my part, but that's fundamentally um, accurate. And now MBS and his brother, who's the defense minister, want a, a military that actually can function. So they need reliable um, arms. Right now, they're extremely dependent on the U.S. because most everything they have is American um, made. But if they could get that kind of commitment, and I don't see how they can, because I don't believe, and I don't, I don't, I don't know why they would believe a U.S. Congress, frankly, that even if it approved a a, a treaty and and, a, and promised to guarantee the weapons, the next Congress may not. So maybe there's some scheme that the U.S. can come up with that reassures them. I personally um, doubt it, but that is a, that is what they want. I don't believe they believe they're going to get it. I think that's an interesting way to put it. It, it, it they, they, you know, they're clear eyed on this, um, and I think they've been uh, much more forceful in, in in saying this is what we want, this is what we'd like. Recognizing that getting the you know sixty votes or getting ratified in Congress is unlikely. Uh, they do really want the U.S. to make uh, appropriate accommodations for them to uh, build a, a domestic nuclear. Mm -hmm. uh, energy system, you know, they want to build 16 nuclear reactors, they want to enrich hydrogen, they'd like to be able to export it. Uh, and, I, and I think that would, that's in there. I wonder if that's not the, really the thing they really want. I think that's the thing they think they might be able to get. All right. That they want it, but they also think, I believe that they might be able to get it because, you know, what they're saying is, we want to enrich our uranium. We don't want to, you know, we have a considerable um, quantity of uranium in our ground. We don't want to sell a bunch of dirt with uranium in it. We want to enrich that uranium and use it in our reactors and sell it to other people. Um, I mean, France uh, has nuclear reactors um so they would like to they would like to have that uh, capability um you know we uh, approved india uh producing uh, uh having a similar program and they produced a bomb with the um uh, uranium um the saudis are saying y y the americans can deal can manage this inside the kingdom. Uh, we're not trying to build a nuclear weapon. Um, whether Congress will buy that, I think my judgment is they have a better chance of getting Congress to approve that. And again, once once you have once things are going, it's um, it, it's harder to pull that back because they're enriching the uranium and uh, and it's on their soil and it's theirs. Um, so I think they have, I'm repeating myself, a higher chance of getting yeah. that out of the Congress than the other, than a security arrangement or guaranteed uh, weaponry. You have one of the sections uh, in this Saudi first paper is on the development of a, a local military capability in terms of production. But before we get there, uh, I wanted to, you have a really striking comment about normalization with Israel. Mm -hmm. And it speaks to the crown prince and it also speaks to Saudi Arabia's per, uh, perception of itself in the uh, Islamic world. And you say, because the crown prince is vividly aware of leading, not following, he tells those close to them he will not follow tiny Bahrain, the UAE, Morocco, and Sudan, and joining the Abraham Accords and recognizing Israel. 
Instead, Saudi normalization with Israel would be a new initiative by the crown prince intended to pave the way for other major Islamic nations like Indonesia and Malaysia. I thought that was fascinating because that's a real insight of where he sees Saudi Arabia in the world. Yeah, I think, you know, he he sees himself, he sees the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, not in, it's in the same geography as the Gulf countries, but it it's really on a completely different plane in his mind than all of those little countries, Bahrain, UAE, uh, Qatar. Um, and he sees Saudi Arabia as the bridge between the world and the Middle East and the Middle East bridge to the world. Um, so it, that's what I mean by uh, and to the Islamic world. Uh, <clears throat> so, it, it, as you know, I think uh, his relationship with the UAE has become very strained because uh, MBZ, uh, as the uh, UAE ruler is known, was one of his mentors. Um, and MBZ now sees his pupil um uh, outdoing him in a, in um in many things and not not willing to follow uh but expecting to lead mm. um so that uh that tension uh is growing but <clears throat> i think if he if he could get um that it, he wants to validate saudi arabia's leadership not just of the Arab uh, world, but the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. So as you pointed out earlier, I mean, he start, he began his reign, frankly, by offending almost everybody in the Middle East, um, you know, breaking relations with Qatar, invading uh, Yemen, um, having terrible relations with uh, Turkey after the Khashoggi murder and their isolation in um, leaking uh, details um, and uh, um, and cutting off uh, Syria and then uh, forcing the Lebanese prime minister to um, uh, retire. <laughs> um, and, you know, now he is doing the opposite. I mean, on everything, they've restored relations with Qatar. They've added Syria back into the Arab League, um, improved things uh, a bit with um, Lebanon. Um, but, you know, he is he's very much trying to calm down the region, improve things uh, with Iran. And I find it ironic that actually now his greatest tension in some ways is with um, the UAE, um, because of the competition between the UAE and Saudi Arabia for tourism, for sports events, for um, everything. <clears throat> yeah, that's 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 that is very interesting. You mentioned <clears throat> uh, one of the sections in Saudi First is on essentially military capability and competence, and you point out that Saudi Arabia has the third largest defense budget in the world. Yet its military capability is ranked 22nd by Global Firepower, an independent group. Mm -hmm. um, Iran, which spends, as you say, less than half, is ranked 17th. Uh, this is a priority for for uh, Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, how are they doing in this regard? I I think it's it, it's only, in my view, only just beginning. I mean, um, they. <clears throat> they are trying to build um, a lot of just useful um, military hardware. As we're finding out in Ukraine, it's not the sophistication of the weaponry that matters in that case. It's the, the supplies, the number. And um, that's part of what, I mean, Saudi Arabia has sophisticated American aircraft and you know, Patriot defense, uh, missile defense, et cetera. But 
you know, what they might may need if Iran attacks them with scores, hundreds of drones, just cheap drones that they're um, building um, and selling to Russia to, to use in Ukraine. Um, you know, it what will be necessary is much more um, simple weaponry. So they are trying to do what they can do uh, to build uh, a a defense industry that would allow them not only to supply themselves with some things, but also to sell them um, to for hard currency earnings to other um, militaries that need need quantity more than sophistication. You had um, you you really interesting section in this in Saudi first paper on the workforce. Essentially, you were saying uh, foreign workers are needed to fill the workforce gap. And as as you're aware, Mohammed bin Salman has some very ambitious population goals. He'd like to see the country reach 50 million by 2040, mm-hmm. I believe. Um, uh, they just had their 20, their most latest census come out. There's 32 million Mm-hmm. In Saudi Arabia, about forty percent of the foreign nationals. Um, if I can make one more connection and plug the Sustag Review, one of the one of the one of the uh, articles we cited today was that Saudi Arabia is one of the most attractive uh, places mm-hmm. for uh, expats looking for jobs because the pay is so high because they're trying to attract so many. But you 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 say the foreign workers are going to be needed to 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 reach their goals. Can you expand on that a little? Well, they simply don't have the educated population. Uh, They have some very well-educated people and some incredibly impressive people. But after, you know, basically not making education a priority for 30 years, um, they they need vastly more um, educated people people to achieve the he's not just looking for somebody that can push paper he wants to be a cutting edge technological country those kind of people don't exist without uh, uh, some educational preparation Um, and I mean there they there are some in Saudi Arabia I know a woman with a PhD in artificial intelligence from Columbia University um you know, so it's not that they don't have any of these people, but they don't have nearly enough. So they need a lot of um, highly educated expats. Many of the expats, as you know, who are in the country are, as I believe the survey you cited there, the, um, are from Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. They are more um, low, low wage um workers um and he needs the high wage um sophisticated educated uh workers and while that survey uh, you cited talks about the high wages um they have not had the success they need in attracting those people and one of the things that interests me is you know whether um I mean, the country is vastly freer now um, socially. I mean, there's still no alcohol and there is still no, allegedly no religious services other than uh, uh, mosques, although I've been to a religious service and uh, a Christian service in Saudi Arabia. Um, <laughs> um, so... It, but the things that Westerners want, um, and especially the ability to speak, I mean, the 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 controls on political um, discussion and the fact that, you know, somebody can just say something that they don't actually mean in a negative way, but, you know, wind up in um, in r- real trouble. Um I think some of that probably unnerves Westerners. So, you know, whether he can get the quality of people, the quality and quantity 
he needs without a little bit of um, loosening up on the political discussion front is to me uh, an open question going forward. It's been, it's something we've talked about in the 966, um, the great urgency, and obviously there's significant metrics that are put out there with, you know, the vision 2030 and, and there's been progress in different megawatts and a lot of the uh, regulatory environment has been redone. Legal environment is being mm -hmm. redone, but you can't hurry education. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got a generation's worth that you, you know, and that's that's what they're 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 late to start on. They they're trying to clean up a lot of their curriculum in schools. It's been really fascinating because we're big fans of the uh, uh, scholarship program. It's fascinating how they've refined that to target more mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. STEM and and they, you know in in areas and disciplines they think they really need. But again, but you you can't sort of throw a bunch of money at it and make it happen sooner than a generation will allow. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there was a lot of when I was doing my book and spending intense time there between 2006 and uh, 12, um, you know, there was a lot of talk then of education and King Abdullah created the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology uh, to invite the best and the brightest from around the world to go to university there in hopes of providing an example to their university system to get it to actually use inquiry as opposed to um, the stuffed goose model of, uh, of uh, learning. And they changed the books, but it, you know, it really takes as, as the, what the deputy minister of education told me then, you know, what happens inside the classroom when the teacher shuts the door we don't have any control over and that's clearly incredibly um true um i mean one of the things i'm interested in focusing on more is what is actually happening now these days you know a decade after i visited a lot of universities and high schools etc what is going on in the um in the classroom. Uh, in those days, I visited a high school, a girl's high school, and um, th this was a good one in the vicinity of King Saud University, so had a lot of professors, uh, kids in it, and um, the class had been given an assignment to um, do a presentation about having a meal. So these three girls got up in front of the class and they were reading from their transcript. And um, one of them said, and when you serve wine, the put the glass on. <laughs> and they'd obviously read this on the um, internet or in some book. And then I looked at the superintendent and she looked at me and, you know, because hearing them talk about serving wine, and the English teacher, who was the teacher in the class, looked at both of us like they're speaking great English. What am I supposed to do? I mean, it was a really, um, a really funny uh, moment. One of those things you, if you don't go in the classroom, you don't see uh, that kind of uh, thing. But anyway, I would like to go in some classrooms again. Um, because it does take it does take a long time. And again, that's why I keep coming back to women are so important because they are educated and their parents are now um, willing to let them work. I mean, there's so much of the the uh, keeping women hidden was because if your neighbor's daughter is not working, you don't you know, it's you don't it would be shameful for you to flout convention and allow your daughter um to work so i met a young woman in jazan down on the yemen border and she was at working um uh, in an airport but she was going to um, nursing school and she said her sister had wanted to be a nurse but the family said absolutely no 
and she's four years younger. So mm. they said to her, okay, you can do it. Um, you know, the, the mores have changed um, quite quickly. So hopefully with the government focusing, as you said, no longer providing scholarships to everybody for whatever university they can get into and whatever subject they want, but focusing on providing scholarships for the um, important uh, STEM requirements that they need will help them, but it will take time. I think he understands this totally. I mean, it's changing the economy will take time, even if you had educated people at the ready, but they don't. So it's one of the reasons you see so many you know, giga projects to do this and to do that um, early in the, the uh, 17, 2017, 18, et cetera, um, is it keeps, it's marketing. It keeps people believing that modernity is coming and it's big time um, and it mesmerizes the, the uh, young people with that uh, vision. Um, and I'm fond of quoting Napoleon said the people who change the world are not those that, you know, uh, work with the elite, but those that uh, move the masses. Mm. And I think MBS totally believes that, that he has to move the masses and the masses are the young. So he has to keep them engaged. He has to keep them moving forward. And he he's under no illusions, I think. He knows that this is a time consuming um process and he he knows how to provide bread and circuses as the romans would say how to distract people until you have you know gotten them um to where they need to be that's a fascinating observation and it it reflects i think a lot of what we see is there's fundamental changes going on <laughs> requiring uh, you know, significant assets and 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 commitment, but also there's a branding thing, uh, you know, operation going on. So anyway, it's very multifaceted. It's not just one thing. And and it's what's funny is you know the news of the day so often for Westerners is sports washing. Another example of something that has a branding aspect, but really has some other fundamental uh, goals underneath it. Uh, you know that it's really just not just one simple thing. Yeah, he. I mean. I, I, I gather from what I've been told, he's not a soccer fan. Um, he was a video game fan, but you know, he's, he's again, smart enough to understand that sports is another huge area for making money. Um, so while changing the image of Saudi Arabia, the image of Saudi Arabia changes by its being active in sports. And having Cristiano Ronaldo and uh, Lionel Messi as a uh, ambassador, it is about the. I believe for him, it's about the money. Stupid to quote uh, Bill <laughs> Clinton. Uh, it's the economy. Stupid, and for him, it's the economy. Stupid. It's about you know um, revamping um, and and. Tourism and sports, they're all linked. If you get people to come to your country for some big sporting event, you can try to move them around the country to see your tourist sites. I mean, it's um, it's all quite logical, I think. But the sports washing accusation will, I'm sure, can continue. And it does change the image. I mean, undeniably, it changes the image. It's just that that's not what it's not the reason. <clears throat> uh, Karen, I'm glad you mentioned that. You're a longtime, obviously, observer of Saudi Arabia, visitor, journalist. Part of what we're doing with this podcast is seeking to talk about the issues that are actually important to Saudi Arabia and to understand it based on coming through every bit of information we can possibly get in our hands mm -hmm. from all sides on Saudi Arabia visiting there often, listening to real Saudis on this podcast and off this podcast. The Wall Street Journal has excellent reporting on the kingdom. Yes. Summer Said, Stephen Kalin, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing others. It's fantastic. And a good commentary section that mentions the kingdom with valuable voices like yours and others. And I'm wondering if 
part of the disruption and difficulty for media organizations over the last, let's call it two decades, depending on how far you want to go back with that. And there's a scale back in foreign bureaus and reporters abroad in general from US based organizations. Mm -hmm. Is that a contributor to the chasm or the what the US media focuses on with Saudi Arabia? versus what Saudis, what's important to Saudi Arabia and what's important to, what are Saudi priorities? Um, would you agree with that, that maybe there's just a lack of, or a shortage, I should say, of real coverage and quality reporting on what's actually going on? Absolutely. Um, you know, in the old days, when I first uh, began going abroad as a diplomatic correspondent in 1978, you know, when you went to the Egyptian-Israeli talks in uh, Cairo, there were scores of uh, U.S. reporters um, from Miami, from Chicago, from um, three newspapers in New York, um, from San Francisco. I mean, now, if, if there's the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, that's about it. Um, yeah. And Bloomberg, maybe, yeah. And yeah, yeah. Well, Bloomberg, Bloomberg does a good job. I mean, from my point of view, they were competitors with Dow Jones, but I'm a subscriber to Bloomberg, and I find it as as uh, useful as uh, you know. I was describing your um, service. I mean, because they do so much, they have so many people. I think the Journal does an incredibly good job. Um, of both um, of, of actually presenting the way the kingdom is moving, you know, in a in a factual and fulsome way without snide comments or, um, you know, I mean, I, I think the reporting is just uh, incredibly professional. Um, that and China, they do both of them <laughs> a great <laughs> job on. <clears throat> and I don't Tell you, I obviously can't take any credit. I haven't been there in uh, 15, 20 years, you know, in, in charge. So it's not, I'm not patting myself on the back. It's just, you know, the journal continues to be very good. It's, we would agree with you, I think. Yeah. It, it's been a great resource for us. And I'd like to do a shout out because Stephen Kalin is a fellow graduate of Davidson College. He's ah. a foreign correspondent for Wall yeah, Street Journal. Does him. a really good job. I know him. <laughs> and I know Davidson College. My best friend from first grade. Father moved there as a professor. You know, <laughs> it's the first time I heard of it. But uh, didn't um, didn't uh, what's the great basketball? Steph player? Curry. Steph yes. Curry. Steph yeah. Curry yes. Uh, also went there. So there are some very famous. Uh, Davidson Gray. Absolutely. And way back to well, way back, Dean Rusk went there as well. But there's a the um so anyway, it, no and, but you know, Stephen does it, you, you agreed. Wall Street Journal does a does a, a first rate job on he's um, he's, ex he's extremely good. Go go wildcats. Last go question wildcats. If, we, if we may. Um <laughs> you uh travel has been extensive to Saudi Arabia over your career. Forty five years you said was ago roughly was your first visit. What do you have a next visit to Saudi Arabia planned? I'm sure it's not in the next six weeks uh, during the summer, um, as you are in Maine now. But do you have a next visit to Saudi Arabia planned? Yeah, I'm um, hoping to go. I just got a new passport and thus a new visa um, and am um, planning to go in late September or October. Very nice. Fantastic. American journalist, author, media executive, and Pulitzer Prize winner, Karen Elliott House. It was an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on the 966. Thank you for having me. I truly enjoyed it.